Scorn, despite being an abandoned wasteland, destroyed due to usage of multiple chemical weapons in different wars. It still has a lot of living entities and monsters who have survived the fallout of the chemical weapons. The developer of the game, Ep Software, a Serbian team who wanted to design a game around the idea of a living nightmare and being thrown into the world, were greatly inspired by the work of H.R. Geiger and Izdzisław Bekszynski the nightmare artist of Poland. While the game is set in first-person perspective, the game is primarily an immersive experience that focuses on exploration, puzzles, and light combat that isn't really a first-person shooter. Ammo is highly limited and the very first gun the protagonist finds is a close-range weapon which makes you get too close for comfort to the nightmare-fueled monstrous entities. Thanks to Kepler Interactive for sponsoring this video and making it possible to analyze this mystery world even further. Scorn is out right now and is available on Steam, Xbox, Epic and GOG. The very first entity the protagonist encounters is in fact not a hostile enemy but a humanoid who assists the protagonist whether willingly or unwillingly in his quest to find a way out in this hostile world. This entity belongs to a group of mutated and experimented on human class who are known as the Moldmen. Despite the name, Moldmen can be both men and women who have a distinct look to them with their bodies being mutilated. Unlike the average class, Moldmen in fact have a mouth which might indicate how they have been specifically modified over generations to prevent them from being as advanced as the average class citizen, who have their mouths shut but instead have two vertical lines which might indicate that the average class has been modified to not require food anymore, or food from different sources, limiting it to only one source. Moldmen can also be clumped together or processed which causes them to grow exoskin and due to being in a compressed stationary position for years, their skin starts to mold and melt around whatever they are pressed against. Moldman backstory is one of the saddest in the lore of Scorn, a class who have been modified and enslaved, having no rights whatsoever with their main purpose being to serve the Scorn civilization in whatever means possible, commonly being used as spare parts with certain machines in the control room preparing them however fit. The Moldmen also resemble human bodies the most, conveying how they have been deprived of advanced selective of breeding and modification, keeping them weak and vulnerable to external harm. They are again unlike the average citizen who have prolonged collarbones and reinforced bone structures, protecting them against external harm and making them much more resilient. There are signs of incision on the mold men, which also depicts not only their body parts are recycled and used as spurs, but also their internal organs are harvested. A disease that is prevalent on these humanoids is something called or core, which can develop due to malnutrition. This wouldn't be surprising as the Moldmen are treated as spare parts not even given the dignity to have their own names, pre-processed and compressed in a dried nugget left on a wall for future requirements. It's impossible to think how they are fed but clearly they are not fed very well or for long periods, possibly modified and bred to withstand and survive long periods without food but not modified well enough to keep their bodies well maintained. The original body as seen in the game and the book don't go far from typical human body and anatomy in the real world, but the result of being kept away for what seems to be weeks, months, or even years, one of the surviving moldmen has seen how his skin has melted, getting stuck to the dried nugget surrounding him. This isn't far from reality, as if a human or any other organic being stays stationary in one place without moving, their skin starts melting and binding to the material pressed against them. The skin growth is clear clearly seen on the mold man in the game who struggled walking, stumbling down repeatedly. This is also another condition called muscle atrophy which occurs from long periods of disuse of a certain muscle. Due to being stationary in one place for so long, the mold man suffered from muscle atrophy causing him to struggle walking. There was a case in real life where a woman sat on a toilet seat for over two years which caused her skin
skin to grow around the toilet seat, getting her stuck which required surgery to remove her. That's also the same scenario with the mold man who required the circular saw to get out of the dried nugget he was compressed in for so long. Mold men are seemingly the most innocent and vulnerable class in scorn civilization who were bred and modified to be used in a world which runs on biomechanical technology. Just like battery farms, mold men are crammed in tight places to save space, even at times molded into each other with complete disregard to their health and welfare. The very first threat the protagonist faces in this hostile world are the flying drones which fertilize the parasite room. It's difficult to identify them as an entity, but despite the biomechanical nature of them, they contain something organic inside. These drones spray the parasite room in order to grow more fleshy beings, of which one could be synthesized humanoids or shells. The spray seems to be hot for some reason, which could potentially burn the protagonist if he ever gets too close to them. These threats, however, are not too too intimidating as they keep their positions and can be easily destroyed using the pressurized weapon. Their purpose, as the name suggests, seems to be fertilizing the room and they get activated by equipment already in place in that room. The very next threat the protagonist encounters comes in the form of a parasite which acts as the companion of the protagonist until the very end. The parasite seems to be the combination of one human who has decomposed to some degree, with half of his face having exposed skull with the other side having full on skin with a moving eye. The brain of this human who transformed into a parasite is exposed which acts as a latching point to its victims. It's not very clear if there's any humanity or consciousness left in the human who transformed into the parasite, but through the parasite's actions acting with extreme hostility, it is extremely unlikely. Despite that, the intact side of the human transformed into the parasite seems to move on its own, not showing any hostility such as trying to bite or perform other actions, which could possibly mean this person in fact is alive and has self-awareness still, but to a highly limited level. The legs of this human have devolved into claws which latch onto the hips of the victim with a long tail Grown, which latches into the biomechanical weapons and allows them to be used. It's described in the book how the relationship of the protagonist and the parasite is in a symbiotic manner, which means they both benefit from each other's presence. The parasite seems to stay alive, latching to the protagonist, extracting the nutrition it needs, while the protagonist manages to use weapons and use two extra arms to carry other tools. However, as time passes, the parasite becomes more overpowering and dominating. They digging deeper into the protagonist's innards, causing roots and tendrils grow within the protagonist, making the parasite grow into the protagonist and become part of him, which could potentially cause the protagonist to completely lose control, becoming more hostile and instinctive. That's when he uses a machine which seemingly was intended for repairing and reinforcing cyborgs, but the protagonist instead uses it to detach the parasite from his body, which comes down to sheer force, pulling the parasite like an fused tumor, which seems to be every bit as excruciating as it sounds. The doomed and ill-fated protagonist, however, doesn't get any luckier as the parasite attacks him towards the end when he's so close to the final gate which he is completely defenseless against. At this point, the parasite fuses with the protagonist, creating a codependent entity where the parasite seems to have more control over. The protagonist at this point has to witness his failure at reaching the gate, defeated in the knowledge of how close yet far he was from salvation. The parasite also seems to be the very first protagonist as when he latches to the last protagonist it provides him with an already acquired weapon and also the parasite has already a hand key. Crater creatures are the result of already established DNA sequences which are spit out by an enormous entity called the Crater Queen. In the book, it's mentioned that the Crater Queen, the source of all these creatures being alive, is unintentionally created from all the discarded parts of living tissue from Scorn's birthing wall known as the Genesis Wall. The wall which is the typical way of birth in Scorn, where humans are born independently of two partners. The DNA sequences and materials the Crater Queen hemorrhages 
began to take form and become their own independent entities, hence why they have human parts such as paws including fingers. Throughout the game, four different types of these creatures are encountered. The flying kids, chicken-shaped entities which spit out toxic bile like projectiles, the four-legged creatures which are labeled as bears which vomit acid, and bigger more aggressive types which charge at the protagonist like a raging bull. These monstrous entities which have adapted to the hostile and toxic environments of scorn, with chemicals covering the sky and air, are the freaks of nature, speeding the process of evolution by millions or billions of years. These entities are instinctive and don't display any individuality or personality. As a matter of fact, they only attack the protagonist as a measure of self-defense. If the protagonist leaves them alone, stays out of their sight and in a safe distance, they crawl back into holes joining other creatures, forming a braided network of these tumorous growths. It's mentioned that these entities are the same exact organism, being identical to each other genetically, just having adapted different wrappings, giving them their distinctive looks. The evolution of these entities is a lottery, with clumps of meat and tumorous lumps growing and adapting together, creating these independent and multicellular beings. These entities are completely faceless with no identifying features, just with wrinkly and veiny wrappings, which resemble skin, keeping all of their innards together. The crater queen, despite looking innocent, who was evolved in the crater where all the waste material from the birthing wall seemingly is dumped into, in other words being the biohazardous landfill, seems to have been under thorough observation through multiple monitoring rooms in the crater, as of the scorned civilization actually was fascinated by this creature. They kept the creatures under control seemingly, but due to war or other catastrophes, they left their posts and abandoned the city, leading to the creatures overtaking the entire city. Some other entities the protagonist comes across to, despite their looks, pose the most threat. Homunculi are explained to be creatures artificially created in red-shaped jars where they mature in, with the main purpose of their existence and creation being to find other kind of living substance for consumption. Seemingly, they were the result of experiments with hallucinogenic matter that people in scorn used for reaching higher states of consciousness. This is why the protagonist uses their essence to give life to the shells and revive them which in turn allows him to reach the ability to detach from his physical form and jump his consciousness. According to the book, this means that the protagonist didn't actually fully detach his consciousness, which would give rise to a shapeless form which resembles Lovecraftian creatures, but instead he uses the matter in homunculi, a hallucinogenic, which allows him to temporarily reach higher levels of consciousness. That's why his consciousness is booted back to his original body after a short period, which means the effects of the hallucinogenics were rough. Now something unintentional that came with the creation of these small creatures was the unexpected intellect and advanced skills in engineering that they possessed. It's unclear if they were commonly consumed for reaching higher levels of consciousness, but one thing for sure was that they were put to work for creating cyborgs, utilizing otherwise useless body parts and corpses to create strong and powerful beings known as the cyborgs. Possibly the most intimidating enemies the protagonist encounters are the cyborgs who were created by the intelligent homunculi. These part machine, part humans are fully under the control of these little creatures with no self-awareness of their own. These little creatures wear the cyborgs as exoskeleton which gives them the protection against any hostile or unfriendly visitor, with the cyborgs also being packed with the latest weaponry. The extent of their use is not clearly mentioned in the book, however, they are referred to as soldiers and also that the scorn civilization treats any cadaver like recyclable material, just how we treat plastics. Therefore, it's highly likely that the civilization allowed these unintentionally masters of engineering, artificial creatures creatures create cyborgs for defending their citadel and world against other hostile civilizations in the world of Scorn.
Other artificially created entities within Scorn are wearable beings known as shells. As the name suggests, they simply act as shells, a protective layer for the consciousness to inhabit. They are much stronger than the conventional bodies that humans are born within. They do not bleed and have points of entry for the representation of consciousness to enter through. Shell's shape is not only limited to humanoid forms. They can also be animalistic shapes or shapes that do not cross any human's mind. As the process of consciousness Consciousness extraction is performed by the mechanical doctor representing Scorn's mythological deity. They find their way to the intended shells. The full process is shown in the game, but it seems to deviate from what is suggested in the book. The game shows how the protagonist's temporary consciousness is extracted using the essence of homunculi, which affects soon whereof kicking the protagonist back to his original body. What seems to fully complete the transference as a brutal method of which the doctor inflicts pain on the patients, who fully immerse in the highest level of consciousness, being extracted from their original body, being in other words freed from the constraints of their original shell, finding the shells which are intended for them. Finally, we have the mechanical machine which many have referred to as the Doctor. This machine is in the shape of Scorn's sacred deity in their religious beliefs which performs this painful ritual thought to be sacred and pure. The bodies of which the consciousness is extracted from become completely devastated and that is apart from the damage this machine inflicts on the pilgrims as the consciousness itself seems to exit from the head. This machine is in the shape of their sacred deity as this ritual is thought to be religious, hence why the machine sends the higher blessings for the pilgrims leaving their body and achieving the full potential of ascended consciousness. I have fully explained the religious beliefs of Scorn and what the doctor symbolizes which you can watch by hitting the card above and that's why I won't get much more into it not to make this part repetitive. You can give Scorn a try yourself and explore its puzzling world and let me know what your thoughts are about its symbolisms and little details which I could have easily missed. Scorn is out right now and available on Steam, Xbox, Epic, and GOG. And that's it for this video folks. If you enjoyed that, you can stay tuned for more by hitting on the subscribe button and the notification bell. It's been your host R. Until the next video, have a fantastic day.